There's three key steps to the application process. One is obviously all the work that has to go on pre-submission by you to get the application in and get it pulled together. And that's not just you as the investigator, obviously, but your colleagues and your research team and the sponsored programs and all of at the university, all the sort of things that go into getting a grant application put into the process. I mean, I'll mention some of the things that can happen along the way in terms of NIH sort of help with that. Then there's the sort of submission through review process um, where you're in the dark. And as a program officer in my prior life, I was in the dark as well. Um, we have a firewall between what the review panels do and what the program officers do, um, which is slightly different, actually quite different from what uh, National Science Foundation does and other funding agencies. Um, so we keep a firewall between those two things so that um, we're, we're not influencing the review in any way as program officers. And then once the review is done, there's still post-review funding decisions that need to be made. And if all goes well, that'll take eight to 10 months to happen from your submission through to funding. Um, and and that, that's only if you get funded on the first try. If you don't, then you're coming back in and resubmitting um, with a response to reviewers and doing that yet again. And then the, the people that you're involved with throughout that process are important to sort of keep in mind. So program officers can help you a lot. We, you know, they develop the funding announcements. They provide pre-application assistance. And I have to tell you, one of the things that was always one of the funny things to me when people contacted me or called me when I was a program officer was I hate to bother you. And I would always say, this is my job. My job is to provide you with pre-application assistance. Now, I'm not going to tell you how you ought to design your study, right? But I can tell you if this, the area that you're working in is something that the NIH is interested in, how you might sort of think about funding announcements that might shape it, um, the type of things you might want to consider, things that I've sort of heard and review that you might want to make sure you're paying attention to. So there's a number of things you can get from a program officer in that pre-application process that's really useful. And then, like I said, program officers step away after the submission comes in and they don't do anything until the review is done. And then they're helpful with making funding decision recommendations to the Institute director. And if it gets funded, they also then become the project officer that monitors the grant progress over time. The scientific review officer is the person who um, organizes the review panel. They invite the appropriate reviewers based on the expertise and the review areas that are needed for the grants that they have, or grant applications that they have. Um, they're responsible in ensuring that the um, review is fair and it's impartial, and they're the ones that write a summary of the review discussion that occurred. So, and whether a discussion occurs or not, you're always going to get feedback from reviewers about what they thought about your application that you can then use to sort of improve it over time. And then the last sort of group of people to be aware of are grants management specialists, and they, they don't probably get enough. They're the business end of what we do, and they probably don't get enough uh, love over the course of time, but it's really important that you, you work with them once it looks like you're likely to get your grant funded, because there's a lot of just-in-time information that's needed, including sort of your IRB approvals and that sort of thing that need to be dealt with there. So they handle the business side of that. So in preparing your submission, just a couple of thoughts here. One, you're going to need to generate an abstract or a specific aims page for your research for your grant application anyway. Start there. Um, write an abstract or write a specific aim page for the research you want to do um, and base it on your prior research, your interests, NIH interests, et cetera. And then identify the relevant institute and center and program staff and reach out to them for their perspective. One of the things that when people called me and had this sort of loose, diffuse idea, um, it was really hard to be helpful to them. But if they sent me, here's the specific aims and I wanna to talk to you about it, can we schedule something in a week or two weeks? Then it gave me something to review and think about and I had a really clear idea of what it is that the researcher wanted to do um, that was, I think, really helpful. So uh, by all means, the one, if I had like one thing to say in pre-application assistance that's useful, is make sure you've written out an abstract or specific aims and provided that to a project officer before you talk to them. Um, one other quick thing, I, I know one of the hardest things to do is figure out who, what project officer you should talk to. Um, again, if you go and look at the grants that we've recently funded in the area that you're looking at, you can often figure out from that who the project officers are, who are managing those grants, and they're most likely the people that you want to talk to. 
Our office is more than happy if you're not sure what institute or center you should be talking to or who's most appropriate, we can help sort of uh, navigate that and make sure you get to the right place. Um, they'll also identify the appropriate funding mechanism based on scope and estimated budget. Um, and then a reminder just to loop your sponsor programs office in early and often. Um, I, I know the sponsor program offices um, hate having something dropped in their lap with only a few days to go and say, I need you to approve my budget and make sure my grant application looks good before I send it in. Um, and then make sure you get feedback from others, your other colleagues about your draft application. Um, remember that reviewers aren't necessarily, other than probably the primary viewer, don't have necessarily as much expertise as you might. And actually having someone else in your, not exactly in your area, but someone else that you trust and respect sort of read your application, make sure they understand it um, is a useful sort of step moving forward. All right, next slide. Watch time too. Okay, um, a few tips for that grant application. It's really useful and important to include a cover letter um, that identifies both the institutes and centers and the study sections or review panels that you think are appropriate for funding and review. Now the NIH will make that determination, but they often go from what you suggest in a cover letter. And so we can kind of talk through some of the things that you might think about there. Um, make sure you double check all the details. I don't know how many grant applications I've seen administratively withdrawn because people exceeded the page limits or they used the wrong form or they responded to the wrong folder in the wrong way. So just make sure you've got all the details down. And then a, a few thoughts as you're thinking about this from the reviewer perspective. Like I said, they often, the people who are gonna review your application other than the primary reviewer often have probably less expertise than you do in that specific area. So you wanna write so it's understandable to researchers in your more general area. You wanna avoid jargon and also assuming knowledge that reviewers may not have. Um, so you're gonna make sure you, this, and this is the other piece, walk them through your decision process. So if there's a debate in the field about this measure versus that measure or this procedure versus that procedure or in what way you should extract, you know, whatever, um, make sure you've walked them through that you've considered these three or four options and you decide on option B because X, Y, and Z, right? Just make it clear to them. And finally, and probably most important, remember viewers, reviewers have day jobs, that they, they are you, uh, they do other things during the day. Um, they're doing this uh, as kind of a side thing um, without a lot of money um, being paid to them as well to do it. Um, so make your grant application as concise and as well organized as you can. Um, I, I remember, and those of you who have been reviewers have probably done this as well, um, that I've reviewed applications um, sitting on my couch at night with a glass of wine in my hand, and that was the way I got through them. So, um, and it's a lot easier to do all of that if it's well organized and I can go back to this particular section and look at that again and know, be able to quickly find that section again when I'm going through the grant application. So submission through review, um, it's assigned to the Center for Scientific Review on there also are study sections or review panels within each of the institutes and centers as well, but the Center for Scientific Review does most of the reviews for us or organizes them. Um, if you have serious concerns that the study section assigned to your grant doesn't have adequate expertise, you can certainly talk to the scientific review officer about that and ask about whether there are different study sections that are appropriate or if there's what might be appropriate to add reviewers um, with expertise. But the one thing I would warn you about, you can't recommend a specific rev reviewer. If you do that, then they automatically are disqualified and can't be and can't review because you've recommended them, right? So you've already sort of created this conflict of interest by recommending a specific person. Um, all, like I said, all the applications get a written review um, and consider the reviewers' comments carefully. Even if you get a good score, um, you'll still be asked oftentimes by program officers to respond to the reviewers' comments before they fund you. And it's also a good preparation for resubmission. Um, so just make sure you're, you think about those carefully as you move forward. Um, so post-funding decisions, um, the study sections make a review and they produce a score from 10 to 90. And I, the, I've been through two attempts to revise and change our, our scoring procedures and have not ever been able to get it to the point where we make higher scores, better scores. So 10 is actually the best score, 90 is the worst. Um, 
And uh, there's a long history behind that that I don't have time to explain today. But um, most ICs have pay lines and they'll decide what to fund in part based on the pay line that they have. Um, but they all use to a certain degree discretion and they base it on factors like um, things like portfolio balance. I've already, we've already funded as an institute or center six studies like this. We don't need to fund a seventh, right? So they'll do some of that sort of thing and, and sometimes we'll skip the order um, and sometimes um, you know, skip one to pay another. Um, and that's not unusual at the NIH. So there's some decisions that go on that aren't right down the line in terms of how the reviewers sort of consider the, um, both the relevance and the impact of the project. The project officer at this point can probably give you some sense of funding probability. Um, and you can, again, if it looks like you're gonna get funded, grants managed specialists will start to talk to you about just in time information. Um, and just a reminder that nothing's guaranteed till you get a notice or grant award from us. So a lot of things look like they might be happening and all of a sudden uh, Congress doesn't give us a new budget or we have another continuation or you know, various other things that make it more difficult to fund some grant. So, um, and just a final thing, and this is probably the most important if you're a grant applicant is that persistence pays off. Um, revise, resubmit, retool if you don't get funded the first time. This is particularly true. We've had a lot of difficulty um, with um, inadequate funding of um, underrepresented minorities as investigators. And one of the things that appears to be different in underrepresented minorities is that they don't come back with enough frequency on a resubmit. They sort of feel that rejection and say, okay, well, I, they didn't like that, so I'll do something different. Um, as opposed to retooling it based on the reviewer comments and coming back in again. So I just encourage you to revise and resubmit if it doesn't go through the first time. For capacity building, we recognize that at the NIH that we have to make sure that people are ready to do the research that needs to be done um, to advance the mission. So there are a number of training awards. Um, there are T awards, which are training awards to institutions, not to individuals, to train a cadre of pre-doctoral or postdoctoral students in area of research. Um, and then there are F awards, which are pre and postdoctoral fellowship awards to individuals. The one thing I would just say about F awards and people have been successful in getting them is a lot of times the speed at which the NIH works is not fast enough for F awards. So you may have been pre-doctoral when you submitted your F application, but you're now postdoctoral by the time we're able to actually fund it and it doesn't really make any difference. So um, it, it's certainly reasonable to do and consider, um, but again, just think about the timing issue there. And then there are K awards, which is advanced training um, throughout the career trajectory, though most of them are focused on early career investigators. And they're a combination of both training experiences and mentored research to prepare you to be an independent career uh, research, um, re independent researcher um, in your career uh, moving forward. There's a few other sort of things because um, we, we realize that uh, we, we also tend to fund the high flyers more and uh, new investigators, early stage investigators, probably don't get the break that they should as early stage investigators. So um, in the last few years, we've had the next generation researcher initiative so that investigators that are within 10 years of their terminal degree, um, get a, we track those carefully at the NIH. Each of the institutes and centers has different ways in which they prioritize funding those researchers so we can kind of keep the pipeline of younger researchers going uh, moving forward um, to do that kind of work. So um, there's a number of ways in which if you're an early stage investigator, there actually is value in coming in with an R01. Um, there's uh, the early career reviewer program as well. Um, so one of the things I encourage everybody to do, but particularly early career uh, researchers is to if you can determine that there's a specific study section or review panel that is consistent with the kind of research that you do and is consistent with your expertise, is to reach out to the scientific review officer and say, I, you know, I'm interested in being a reviewer. Would you just put me on your list and here's my CV? Uh, that alone um, will um, en encourage them and increase the likelihood that you'll get a review panel. Well, you'll see what the process looks like from the inside, which I think is highly valuable if you actually want to get funded. And this program is particularly for early career uh, researchers so that they can um, get the experience of being a reviewer.